We've already kind of suggested what's next, which is water. I was going to ask you a riddle, uh, because I thought this was pretty interesting. You know, what's the most basic resource a city has that no one thinks about or no one complains about until they don't have it? And it's water. And we've seen that in a big way in Flint. How many of you guys have been following the story in Flint, right? Problem there is what? What's the problem in Flint? Lead in the water, right? They can't drink their own water. That's a bad thing. And we're discovering that this is happening in other parts around the world so, and around the country. We don't think about it until it's too late. We think about a carbon footprint, but we don't think about a water footprint. Well, I told you we're going to have lots of stories and we're going to weave in student storytelling. So here's a story from two students. Alejandro, Frida, are you here? Oh, it's too early. Yeah, there they are. Okay. Two students who said, let's take a look at a water footprint. Here's what they did. The average American directly consumes 2,030 gallons of water a day. That's a gallon and a half per minute. But what about what we virtually consume? 96% of all the water we use comes from our hidden footprint. It's the invisible gallons that go into growing and making the things you eat, drink, and use. So the next time you have an apple, think about it. Alejandro, you're dry. Alejandro Farida, I don't know if we got a, can get a mic over there. What did you learn by doing this piece, guys? Start, Alejandro, you can, or Farida, just scream it out. Yeah, well, we wanted to take a, a larger statistic and kind of make it more digestible and break it down into ways that uh, people might be consuming water. So what was the statistic you started with? It was... 2,000 gallons of water that we consume, each one of us, on a, in a day? Yes, it was, it was something like that, and then we broke it down per item of food, and then... And what order. surprised you most when you, when, you, when you learned that? Yeah, the steak, definitely. The steak was, really? was a huge yeah, footprint. And why the water in the face, Alejandro? I mean. um, well, the whole point is to try to get people to watch, right, and try to make the whole story sort of accessible and a little fun, so we thought it would just be a bit of an attention grabber. Attention. Uh, like the music, too. The music really worked. These guys were in my class. I picked on them really bad, you know, to make them do this. We call this assignment Dazzle Me a Statistic. Find a number, find a trend, find a piece of data, and make it come alive. Make it funny, make it entertaining, make it memorable. And that's what they did. So, guys, thanks very much. So, let's, let's, let's dive in to water for a few minutes. Uh, Flint, Michigan can't drink its water. Fresno, California doesn't have enough water. New York City and London worry about water rising and swallowing the city. So does Dhaka. Who knows where Dhaka is? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Why is Bangladesh a problem? Because it's got a huge delta. And the rising sea level can swallow a good chunk of the country and create hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of climate refugees. So... It is now a pleasure for me to introduce one of the most awesome communicators and storytellers I've ever met. Uh, she was the chief communications officer at National Geographic, which did a whole issue on water a few years ago. Before that, she was uh, head of communications or, or helped to lead communications at NBC. Please welcome, and by the way, she tells me that she will continue to use water for both her laundry, the less, and her martinis. <laughs> Betty Hudson. Good morning. <laughs> this is a martini. Actually, I think it's so wonderful that we had to bring our own water to our, to our panel, and it is a pleasure to be with you. If I had to choose between laundry and martinis, you don't even have to guess which one I would prioritize. Water is such a big deal 
it is almost impossible to get your head around it or, or to, over, to figure out ways to, to make the conundrum of fresh water more understandable. Uh, you all know the statistics, 90, 97% of the water on the planet is salty. 2% of the remaining water is locked up in glaciers, though we're doing our part to change that, uh, with a little climate change. And that leaves 1% left for the fresh water that, that we all have to have as part of our daily life. National Geographic, um, as Frank said, did do an all-water special a couple of years ago. I don't know how many of you saw it. We can put this into the prize package because this is actually quite amazing. In that hidden water video, uh, there's a pull-out map that shows on a bubble chart the proportionality. It's 3,000 gallons of water if any of you are wearing your jeans for one pair. So it, 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 we think of it globally, but it's a hyper-local issue. Um, one in eight people lack access to clean water. Three million die annually from water-related health issues. There's a projection that in 15 years, almost two billion people will live in intense water scarcity. And only 46% of the people on the planet don't have water currently piped into where they live. And we sitting in this country kind of take all that for granted. Water is ubiquitous. It is almost, a, it's our right to have access to water. There's an estimated more than 1 million pipes under our ground, 1 million miles of pipe under the ground. We have a quarter of a million water break, water main breaks a year, which is kind of staggering. The longest water tunnel is in New York City. It's 85 miles long. It leaks 35 million gallons a day, a day. And oh, how did they figure out there was a problem? the water started coming into people's basements. So you, you have to go check it. So we're investing in a stress system that was built for yesteryear. Some of the pipes go back to the Civil War. And we are having to think about how do you design cities for the future. So our focus in our hyper-local way today is on urban solutions and innovations to these problems. And with the problems are intense. There's contaminants, as Frank talked about, the aging infrastructure, climate change. And one of the things I haven't seen noted, there's always the potential of terrorism attacking your water system. And I know we think about that here in Washington. You want to bring some place to its knees, take it off the grid, uh, pollute its water system, and you, you will have a whole new set of problems. But luckily, we have a panel that's going to solve all of that. Thank goodness, We're, we started early because we thought we would celebrate their intense solutions. Let me bring them on. Charlene Lurig, who is director of Texas Environmental Flows Project and a YouTube storyteller in her own right. You have to come out now. Oh, bring your own water. <laughs> Jerry Moyo, the mayor of West Palm Beach, a place that's got water coming at him from, from every direction, is coming up through the ground, is coming down from the sky, cheers. Dr. Royce Francis, who's Assistant Professor of Engineering and Applied Science here at GW. Royce. David Farnham, a PhD student in the Earth and Engineering Department at Columbia University. Good morning, David. And Namrata Shinoy is a graduate student in the Environmental Resources Engineering Department at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Okay. I love the metaphors of let's dive in. That was a good one, Frank. So, Jerry, we do take it for granted the whole thing with water and, and people don't seem to get excited about it until there is a crisis. You are sitting there in West Palm Beach where it, you've got a, a, a growth as part of your, your survival as a city, more people, more demand. The water is literally coming up through the ground and it's, we all have read about the challenges for Florida. How do, you, how do you get people to care? Well, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I became mayor in 2011 in April, and about two months after that, we were in the middle of a significant drought. 
Um, and my water managers told us that maybe we had two weeks of water left in our, in our system. That gets people interested. When you tell them that they can't water their grass, when you tell them they can only take one shower a day, when you tell them that they have to conserve water, they immediately became interested. Now, we have um, in West Palm Beach a surface water system, um, which we're finding is probably beneficial to us because we're not taking water out of the aquifer, which is where the saltwater intrusion is coming. Um, so as a surface water system, we're reliant on um, rainfall. Uh, so uh, we get about 60 inches of rain, and that rain pretty much falls in a five-month period. So our challenge is, first of all, do we have enough supply? And secondly, how do we store what we get during our rainy season? But certainly the drought put water right in front of the people of West Palm Beach. They, they had to start being concerned about water use and what our system looks like. And you, you have... Um Based, I went out and looked at your website, and you, you have a wonderful slogan, Paradise, re, or Reimagine Paradise. Reimagine Paradise. Reimagine Paradise. And you were competing, you got your city competing in contests, uh, water challenges right. with other cities. Right. Does that resonate? I mean, do, do, do people pick that up and, and uh, carry the flag with you? Well, they do. We won it two years ago, oh, so well, we're hoping that we'll win it again. If anybody in West Palm Beach is listening, um, <laughs> go to mywaterchallenge.com and pledge to conserve water. We do a lot in West Palm Beach to bring um, sustainability mm -hmm. to the attention of the, the everyday public. We're giving away 10,000 trees in 10 years. We have low floor, flow, we have vouchers for low flow toilets. People can get a voucher and go purchase a low flow toilet. Mm -hmm. Um, we give away rain barrels. Um, we, we're just doing all kinds of things to raise that awareness. Well, and I did notice the prize in the uh, water challenge is a car, but it is a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, Charlene, you are there in Texas, Austin, Texas, the wonderful city of Austin, keep Austin weird. Uh, and you have studied an array of issues around the water supply, particularly around groundwater, and what happens when you talk Texas, huge place, it's almost a uh, buffet of the issues of water. You've got dr desert, you've got intense population growth, you've got the coastline issues, and we, we'll talk with David in a, a minute about the uh, deluge last, last week, uh, more than a foot of water fell in 24 hours on Houston. Holy smoke. So talk about um, how do you get people engaged in the challenges in Texas? Right. Well, I mean, in Texas, you know, our problem is we have a lot of really smart money building dumb infrastructure, um, <laughs> which seems to be a pervasive problem in, in lots of places across the West. But in our particular place, we have a state where all of our surface water, for the most part, comes from water underground. And yet our plan is to, as the cities grow, and as we kind of buy into this philosophy that growth means we need more water, um, that that means that our only choice is to bring water from where it is to where it ain't. And that's not really new, right? The, the Romans were doing that 2,000 years ago. Um, we need better technologies today, and I think we have to move away from the rhetoric and the paradigm that says, you have to bring water to the city. We have amazing technologies available today that allow the city to function as a water source. We have buildings that can capture and treat their own water. You see this happening in places like San Francisco, where the city is actually inviting people to disrupt the monopoly that water providers have enjoyed for 100 years, where they're the only providers of water. And they say buildings can actually sell water to each other. That's powerfully disruptive, and that's 21st century technology and it's 21st century business model, and it's where the money should be flowing, and that's the point that we have to get to. You had a wonderful line when we were talking um, b before uh, in the green room that uh, it, you had operated, you had seen, been in places that operated, if we don't build it, they won't come. Kind of doesn't work, do, kind of doesn't not working so work well. that way. If, is there a way to begin to impact the demand side, the kind of wanton consumption um, that we can talk about solutions that will incrementally make changes in the supply side, but what do we do about demand? Right. And we're, we only at this point 
are being effective in that way in how we use water inside of our homes. And it has nothing to do with our choices, right? We set federal energy policy that dictated that dishwashers needed to be more efficient. It turns out that we're much more efficient in water because of that. The, where the problem lies is how we use water outside, which can be half of the water that a city uses. And we have a love affair with lawns in the American West and certainly in Texas. So it's going to take, I think, those crisis moments, the mm. drought that, that breaks the camel's back and forces people to turn off their sprinkler systems and to install drought-sensitive landscape and drip irrigation. Uh, but it is not going to go lightly. It's, it's a come-and-take-it sort of mentality. Yeah, it does seem like it, it, when National Geographic was doing this water issue and you... you We've got the water slaves, women who work, walk three and a half hours every day in underdeveloped countries to get water. And you had pictures of them side by side with Las Vegas where we're throwing it in the air, you know, in, in fountains. And other parts of the world look at the developed world saying, you, you, you don't know what a precious resource you have and you, and you don't even treat it quite, quite that way. It's very interesting. But Royce, you have been thinking hard about the issues uh, that were that are surfacing with Flint. That's right. And as we we um, it's inter we're all spun up about lead, but there's a lot of other stuff that we should be thinking about in terms mm -hmm. of what's in that. What is EPA looking at? Is That's it right. the pills we flush down the toilet? Is it the fertilizer runoff? Lead is in some way. I mean, it yeah. that may be one of the canaries in the, wow. in the coal mine. But it, talk to us about how we should be thinking about something that in Flint's case may turn out to literally be a crime. Well, um, it's interesting that you say it like that because yesterday we had the first charges that were brought against three officials. Yeah, that's why I did say it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> um, but as you mentioned rightly, Lead in water is only one of the canaries. And it's ironic because while we're building older infrastructure, or I should say new infrastructure according to old paradigms, at the same time, our detection technologies are advancing very rapidly. And so you just brought up pharmaceuticals in water, what we call PI or pharmaceuticals in the environment. These things occur at part per trillion levels to give you a feel for what that is. If you had a, a, a coal train, so if you had a train, um, that's full of coal, like what we used to see in Pittsburgh all the time. If you just take one of those pieces of coal and put that on that train that's a mile long, this is one part per trillion. Mm -hmm. And now these are the levels that we're able to detect, and this is what is causing some concern about um, pharmaceutical in the environment. And so some of this um, is a canary that's a result of part of our technology advancing and then part of our technology not. And then some of this is a canary because we don't necessarily understand all of the health effects associated right. with all of these things. And so I could say that lead is a canary because we clearly have infrastructure issues that require people to care in order to make investments in things that we know if we fix this problem, we're gonna be better off. And then some things we just have no idea. We don't know if the pharmaceuticals that are being discharged um, from our wastewater treatment plants at extremely low levels, we don't know if that's going to cause um, health effects when that water is brought back into our water treatment plants and drunk. You have also talked it, in some forums yeah. about the issue of certain cities in poorer areas mm -hmm. that this is uh, the investment in the remediation yeah. as well as the investment in the forward looking That's solutions right. may be driven by the uh, relative economic health Absolutely. of an area. Absolutely. If we can use Flint as an example, because everyone here is somewhat familiar with Flint, one of the major challenges is that Flint, just like Detroit or Baltimore City, where I live, has been built out to an infrastructure that's meant to serve a population that's up to two times what you currently see in that city. And so the challenge with Flint, as many of you may have heard, Flint has some of the highest water rates in the nation, if not the highest, depending on the source that you look at. The challenge there is that that infrastructure still needs to be maintained, but they're having trouble recovering um, their, their rate payments from people who may not be able to afford the rates as they go higher. Mm. And so as you have a smaller population who's able to pay, the need remains the same. Those people have their bills increasing, and then we come to a crisis point where we have our 80-year-old infrastructure, it needs to be replaced. Um, in their case, they needed to take their water treatment 
system literally off the blocks, just like you would take your old Camaro off the blocks and fix it back up. They had to take their system off the blocks and pay for that on the backs of a smaller or declining population who is able to pay. And that's really one of the canaries that's probably, in my opinion, most important. While we need to get people to care, even in places where people do care, they're going to be carrying a burden that they may or may not be able to, to carry. And that's really one of the ways that we need to, to, one of the things we need to think about, how are we going to pay for these, these, these upgrades? Yeah, and, and that was one of the, we were also discussing the challenge of convincing people to make an investment today to save money later. It's just a very, yeah. uh, particularly if you feel like I don't have that extra dollar to give you today, even though I know you're telling yeah. me 10 years from now, the cult requirement will be $10. Yeah. Well, in Water's case, I mean, it's, 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 you will spend this money today and yeah. you will have no lead in your pipes tomorrow. Like, it's not 10 years down the line. Yeah. I mean, for some cases, as in, in Flint or, or Lansing or other places where they've been removing pipes, it, it takes some time to figure out which homes to go to. But if you remove that lead pipe today, mm -hmm. there will be no lead in your water tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so this so is the case. So it's a faster return right. on that investment. That's right. And, and uh, to, to keep Frank's uh, positive reinforcement going, the coal on the train, very good storytelling. Yes. That yes. was excellent. Uh, David, I, as you, you, as a student of intense deluge and uh, effects of, of uh, major events, you have been part of what I just said before. You've won the, lot, the cat, reigning cats and dogs um, lottery lately, if this is what you're studying, between the, you have the tense drought in California and then you have huge rainfall. We talked about Houston, but there, we have lots of events, the uh, Hurricane Sandy and what the intensity of that, how urban areas can plan on what appears to be cycles of ever intensifying weather that creates uh, pressure on systems. How, fix that for us. Um, I think, unfortunately, it comes down to the financing, which has been touched on by Royce and Charlene. And, you know, as, as the previous speaker touched on and you touched on, the, the infrastructure is aging, the water infrastructure, flood management infrastructure. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers two years ago gave a rating of D to drinking water system, wastewater system, levees, dams. So everything's passing, but just barely. Um, and what does that look like now? There's an average of 700 water main breaks in the U.S. every day. So that's not only an issue for, you know, some local flooding, people are losing water, then you have economic loss associated with, you know, the businesses that have to close. Um, so I think, I think unfortunately, and, and there are similar stories with, with flood management that it comes down to financing. And part of the issue is from a utility perspective, a lot of the utilities actually aren't recovering the full cost to not just operate, maintain their systems, but then upgrade, right? So we, we're getting to the place with these 700 water main breaks a day where we really need to start thinking about putting in new pipes for not only you know, qual quantity issues, but also quality issues, you know, as you have more lead, um, more lead pipes corroding you know, into the water. So I think it's a tricky issue because ultimately some of that comes into the political realm, which I don't have to deal with as a physical scientist, but <laughs> you know, when, when, a, when a city or a municipality or utility goes to raise their water rates, that's, since water is a natural monopoly, it's regulated, so you can't just jack up the rate because you know, we've decided that water is a human right and we don't want to just you know, put the prices through the roof, but at the same time, as you know, the politician in charge, you're not going to be very popular if you're the one who's overseeing these rate increases in the water bill. Um, but you're less powerful when there's a water main break in somebody's backyard. <laughs> sure. And for example, I pay, so I'm in New York, so it's you know pretty water rich area of the country, but I pay three times as much for my internet and cable bill as I do for water. Right. So that gives you a sense of where you know, the value systems are at. And then when you look at water prices around the country, if I lived in Phoenix, I would pay half as much as I do in New York, which seems pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, from a sort of water availability perspective, so and, about, and the value proposition, right? Of how how critical it is. And to add another wrinkle into this, we talk a lot about conservation, and I think that's great. But from the utilities perspective, most of their costs are fixed costs, so their revenue increases 
um, in proportion to how much water people are using, but their costs are staying about the same. So they actually, do they want you to conserve? They take a hit on their bottom line when you conserve. So that's sort of a, an extra wrinkle there. And the last thing I'll say on the financing is in lieu of jacking up the rates, people are talking about getting some private investors involved. But one of the issues there is we have it's over 50,000 water utilities in the US. So for big equity funds, the investments are actually sort of too small for them to get involved with until we begin to bundle some of these projects. Um, what do you, I saw you uh. kind of, <laughs> when we talk about private uh, interests, the, the uh, companies that come in and will take over for a municipality, the management of the water system, what's your? Well, yeah. um, we had a go around uh, with that, um, you know, shortly after we had the drought and we had a couple of uh, city commissioners who were hot on privatizing our water system. Um, frankly, I'm very opposed to that. I think it's a public's water system and we need to be responsible for it. Uh, so fortunately, uh, we won out on that and we still manage and maintain our water system. I have another, we have so much to discuss, yeah. so many problems to solve. But Shamrata, you are an advocate of exploring a decentralized water system. Tell us what that would, mean, what that would really mean. I think decentralized systems for water supply or wastewater treatment are really the way to go forward. Because what you're essentially doing in this kind of a system is you're giving a bit of the resource to the people who are about to use it. So you're making them responsible and they're more inclined to look after it better when it's when you have the responsibility towards it so rather than when somebody else is doing it for you. So in decentralized water systems, you essentially segregate the water systems and you hand them out to industrial clusters or houses or communities and then they are responsible for the resource. So I think there will be a significant behavioral change when that happens because um, I've stayed in two places. Uh, so back in India, uh, in Mumbai, so there is so much water shortage. I don't know why there is water shortage because I think it's probably poor management of resources. Uh, but we used to get water only for two hours a day. And that versus here where there's 24 hours a day and there's water all the time and there's no shortage. There's a lot of change in the way I use water personally. And then I'm educated, I know about how important water is, but then I would still not think so much about it, honestly speaking. But when you, when you know that there is a shortage and it's really coming, and you can see it in the future, that's when you're really gonna make an effort. So what I'm trying to say is if you have decentralized water systems, you're responsible for it. So you're gonna look after it better. You're gonna use it more wisely. And it's also, um, it's also a very resilient planning. So when you have disasters that strike or any of those situations, uh, uh, a smaller system, a small scale system is more likely to be more resilient than a large scale system. But is that, um, it's, a, it's a glorious vision, but is it practical to implement across our aging infrastructure? Do you have to go in and make investments to redirect pipes? And how do you, how do you, how do you just implement that vision? Um, so when you say that uh, if, if there is a community that you give them the responsibility, so it, it they look after it, so it's easier to invest because it's not large scale, it's, it's a very small investment. And then you're basically taking accounting for the water on your own. So you can reuse your water and it's site specific, so it doesn't have to be the same thing everywhere. Whatever works for you best is what you're gonna do. So on that scale and on that note, it, it makes a lot of, it's sensible, it's, it's sensible. Okay. <laughs> It does sound sensible. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Because I think, I mean, I think this is an amazing thread that's coming out and that's all kind of leading back to challenging this notion that is put out there. Often we hear these statistics. We have to invest, you know, a hundred billion dollars in our infrastructure to just get it back to um, where it was when we originally built it. And that that's the target is to replace what we already have. And I think what we're hearing here is whether it's because of climate resilience or it's because of the inability of communities that have declined over time to be able to pay for restoring that existing infrastructure, if it's because we've undermined our trust in the public estate that is public water. Um, all of that 
leads to the conclusion that we have to go with this distributed decentralized model, mm. but we have to do it in a way that protects public health, right. that restores trust, that maybe leverages private capital, but does it in a way that doesn't bankrupt people who can't afford to pay for basic access to water. And we have to first start by admitting that the centralized model has failed and that it's time for a new 21st century right. model. And, and to play the flint against that, it, it, it's unlikely that the people making a decision over the Flint water system would have made the economic decision to redirect the use for monetary, re they would be looking at a different criteria. That's right. And even the smart money, you know, it's not just the, the public managers. You have very smart money coming in and saving Bayonne, New Jersey's water system from uh, fiscal insolvency. But what they're planning to do is just to restore the 20th century infrastructure. So how do you get those people to understand the next step. And we, were go we talk about restoring the 21st century infrastructure, but we, a component of that is that we routinely watch areas that have borne the brunt of the pressure of the changing climate. New Orleans, we're going to rebuild over and over again in a place where water levels are rising and there are some real questions about uh, the long-term sustainability of those physical locations. So, but we get, it's emotional, it's uh, we won't let it beat us, kind of, you know, we're gonna rise, well, I, Mother Nature is likely to win here, but, but what do you do in the meantime? You're a physical scientist, and if you had a magic wand, what would happen? If I had a, if I had a magic wand, um, I would, I don't want to say force, but I would want people to be more okay with moving away, moving up a hill, Back moving up. away from the sea. I mean, especially in the U.S., we have the luxury of a lot of space compared to most places in the world. So I, I think to get into the game of building a, building a wall or, I mean, you think about Florida, building a wall around all of Florida, it, it seems sort of crazy to me. Well, um, and there's also the problem that I'm there's not, limestone, so it's coming. I mean, right. the wall's not going to help that. I'm not saying anyone's proposing that. Um, so well, we do have a presidential candidate. Right. Yeah, there. exactly. Right. <laughs> the wall, we're going to sure, start sure. across the above and, ground. And right. make the Atlantic right. Ocean pay for it or something. <laughs> um, but just right. to, to jump really quickly back to the closed loop system, I think one of the advantages, and to tie it into Flint, if we do move in that direction, you're actually then testing the water where people are using it. So now, even if the water comes out of the treatment plant clean, which in, in Flint, it was actually coming out clean, right? And then the lead is corroding in the pipes, and it's oh, not tested yeah. before, right. before right. people are drinking it. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's necessarily going to be feasible to go into a closed loop, but the one advantage there is you actually have to start testing the water where it's being used. So, um, there's a lot of that that's already being done. We test our water throughout our system at the farthest end of our system and the beginning of our system constantly, hundreds of tests a day, constantly testing the water. And, and I think it, we also, you also have to start looking at, as Charlene suggested, alternative sources of water. Where, you know, where is there water that we could bring into our system? So we have um, significantly increased our water supply by bringing water in that would have otherwise gone to tide. Um, from, from stormwater. So we're bringing that all back into our system and, and then we have to store it. So we have an ASR well where we do deep injection, store the water. Um, so I, th I think that, yeah, sure, maybe, you know, down the road we're talking about a distributive system. I, I don't know, but I think there's ways to, to make our current systems a lot more viable and a lot more um, responsive to the community need and, and we need to be doing that now. There's no reason that we can't do some of that now. And some of that of course requires public will yes. to move that forward and you, I, I understand you are going to invite a student <laughs> to come to well, we would West Palm Beach is not a bad place to be, by the way. We, student. If I may talk about yes, the challenge may. that we currently have. As I mentioned, we're, we're a surface water system, um, and we have uh, Grassy Waters Preserve, which is our water catchment area. It's 24 square miles of a pristine remnant of the Everglades, and it does exactly what it says. It catches the water when the rain falls, stores it, catches it, and then through a series of canals, we bring it to our um, water treatment plant. Well, 
FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, is proposing to build a four-lane highway through our water catchment system, our water catchment, um, taking up 57 acres of conservation land to build this road. And, and we are fighting them along the way. We have some good support at EPA. Um, Army Corps is questioning the viability, but it, it's very possible that this road will get permitted. So I'm hoping to engage a student or two to help us um, put together this fight. We've been fighting for uh, 10 years at least at this point, but hopefully um, start getting young people involved in helping us to fight uh, the state. And it's the state that's threatening our water system. It's not any terrorist at this point. It's the state. This I'm going to bite my tongue. That's too easy. That's Florida. Easy. <laughs> yeah, it's Florida. But, but, but <laughs> this would be a very good school project. <laughs> you might get an A, a, an a and a, a degree out of this. That is well, At least a visit to West At Palm Beach. At least a visit to West Palm Beach. <laughs> the, um, this is about storytelling we have, and innovations. Yeah. You as a storyteller, and you, she has YouTube videos and all sorts of things that, that are just terrific. What's the most effective message you have ever served up? And, and what, what could we take from your experience? Yeah, um, you know, I, we live in a very delicate and rapidly changing period of time. Um, and the most profound story that's happening underneath all of our feet without our awareness is that the groundwater that all of us depend on, that, that we use to grow the cotton that becomes our genes, that we use to grow cotton to, to feed our cattle that becomes our steak, um, is disappearing. It's disappearing all over the world. If you buy asparagus, uh, it probably comes from Peru and it probably comes from an aquifer that's likely to be exhausted in 25 years. If you go to the Central Valley of California, it's, the, the ground has dropped by about 20 feet over the past 100 years of groundwater pumping and the plan is to continue the same. Um, the stories that I wanted to start telling in Texas were the stories of how quickly things can change in a generation, how the things that you come to expect as just being perennial, as, as always there, can change within a generation. So I went to a place that my dad had grown up uh, swimming in called Comanche Springs in West Texas, which was one of the largest springs in the state, about 30 million gallons a day of water. And it changed within 15 years. After World War II, uh, you had some large landowners who turned on the pumps. And 15 years later, there was no Comanche Springs, and there is no Comanche Springs today. Um, people who live in that town don't remember that there ever really was a spring. I mean, it's a place that you call Comanche Springs, but nobody who's not 80 years old remembers swimming in it. So we went to talk to the farmer who still farms on that land and who still today pumps 30 million gallons of water a day, a day. to grow cotton in West Texas. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and there it's a story, you know, for me it's about creating empathy with both sides, with the people who lost everything because they were surface water farmers and they didn't own the water. They lost Comanche Springs and the people who own the water and who have for the past three generations been planning on owning that water in the future. And if you can empathize with both sides, I think you, that is where you have to start from to understand what the solution is. Yeah, it, it, is, it is always hard to get to that win-win, which is the ultimate way you motivate people to turn. But what I want to make sure before we run out of time is that we get some of you into the conversation and asking questions. And do we have uh, any folks who have one already on their mind? Some right on. here. And are we waiting on microphones or are you yelling and I repeat? Here comes the <laughs> microphone. Hi, um, I'm Veer uh, from Middlebury College, Vermont. Um, there's a lot of like talk about water as a fundamental human right. I was wondering what you mean by fundamental human right. Like, is it contextualized by access or? And also, like, I want to know like how this fundamental human right balances with this like investment mentality that we have to like invest and like and like use capital to like give access to water. But despite that, it's a fundamental human right. So I want to know like how do we balance these both sides? Good question. I want to start with you. Can you start with me? I am. <laughs> um, that's a very interesting question. And um, I think if this was a classroom where I had all engineers sitting in front of me, I would start the discussion by saying that a lot of people cloud their thinking by starting with it being a fundamental human right because they don't understand how complex, how challenging it is to bring water from the 
depth of the earth right. <laughs> if you're in Texas, or from upstate New York if you're in New York City, to the tap where you wake up in the morning and turning it thing. This is very expensive from the fixture that you may have in your designer bathroom all the way through the 100 foot deep tunnel in, in, in New York City. And so unless you personally have money to do that, mm -hmm. that's going to require all of us putting something in. So while it's a right, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's free, okay? And so- Or that it's possible. That's right. <laughs> right. Well, 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 it is possible. Oh, and right, so, but it's or, or, possible being, in the implementable. That's right, that's right. right. And so I guess at the, at the end of the day, what it comes down to, even though we mentioned this presidential candidate a little bit earlier, I think he's insightful in the sense that he said he's gonna make America great again. In baseball here, the reason I brought that in is because in baseball, if you guys like baseball, we have an awesome player named Bryce Harper and he walks around these baseball caps saying make baseball fun again. We need to make people care about water again. We need t-shirts. Let's care about water again. Because at the end of the day, it's only a human right if you're willing, in Flint, Michigan, for example, if you're willing in Lansing or Detroit to pay rates that then go into helping invest in Flint, we can make it a human right. If you're saying, I don't want my taxes in Genesee County to go towards Flint, then it's not gonna be a human right because we're not kicking in, okay? So, so at the end of the day, it's a human right if we're willing to help each other get access to that. But if we're not willing to help, then it's gonna end up being for small cities or rural cities, they're gonna have private owners under consolidated systems. In larger cities, we're gonna start paying $1,000 per year, $2,000 per year bills, because we're not willing to, to, to pitch in and make sure everybody has that water security that you're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. I just, yes, I would just David. add, um, how much is a human right and at what cost, as you're saying. So, I mean, if, you're, if, you, if people can't afford to buy the water they need to survive, you know, then you could decide on like what portion of your income is appropriate to put towards water and then subsidize the rest. Um, but basically, delivering, treating and delivering water below the cost that it takes to do that um, doesn't really make sense. So. Over the long haul, very right. challenging. We have a question in the back, if somebody will get this gentleman a mic. Those involved in public policy, oh, they may, he's right behind you. There you go. For those involved in public policy, there's a challenge of getting people to one, buy, an efi buy efficient technology, but then there's also the challenge of get, getting people to use efficient technology efficiently. So those who might buy a, an efficient washer might be like, oh, then I can use it twice as much, which defeats the purpose. So. Is there any campaigns or strategies to also encourage efficient behavior along with efficient purchasing? Yes, and we, talk, we did begin a little bit um, about how do, you, how do you change the paradigm of demand and use. And Namrata, your observation that you behave differently when you wound up in an environment where water was more ubiquitous and easy to get. When it was only coming two hours a day, you knew when to take your shower. How, how do we change that? What's the mess, what messaging works? Um, they say awareness works, but I was aware, I am still aware, but I think behavioral change only sets in when you, when you know the, it's going to happen and it's happening very soon. And unless you are scared about it, you're not going to change and that's just human nature. Yeah, doing the right thing is not always the motivator. Being afraid of the consequences is more powerful. Can I say something about that, yes. though? So that's actually, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, and that happens in electricity, where we get more efficient, we use more of it. But in water, that's not actually happening. And we mentioned San Francisco earlier. San Francisco, their water consumption is 46 gallons per, per, per day per person. That is astronomically low by American standards. And the reason that's happening is because they're doing water recycling and they're continuing to keep their water use low. In Los Angeles, Los Angeles uses less water today, okay, than they did in 1980. This is before the drought, mind you. We're not even talking about last year or two years. Before the drought, they're using less water today with a third more population than they were in 1980. And so, while this is true with electricity, where you have the, the, the higher efficiency of our appliances makes us use more, with water, that's not necessarily happening. Where it matters is ag. Yeah. 
Because that's right. absolutely right. In the urban context, we're getting more efficient all the time without even really trying because it's just baked into the products that we buy. But with ag, you have places where they're not even bothering to fund farmers to put in more efficient water delivery methods because what happens is they just expand their acreage. Yeah. They grow more crops. You try to use the same amount of water that you always used, but for more yield, for right? More and that's yield. a totally rational decision. Right, because we have more people to feed. Year. Right. Where it comes in, I think, is we have to do what the government of Australia did, which is you buy out the water that you're trying to get people not to use. You buy back the water rights that they hold. You buy portions of their groundwater, and you say, keep it underground. We don't want you to use it. Put in more efficient technology so you can still farm. Terrific. So, uh, well, we, uh, we have time for one more question. <laughs> because I, I, I have an eye on this clock. Uh, and he is over here with his hand up. From uh, SUNY ESF. And this is really a point I'd like, two points I'd like to offer to the students in the room of where we need some more Is stories. this a question? It's, it's yeah, it's, well, <laughs> I want you to know about Hoosick Falls, New York. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but per, now chemists in the room, I might really totally destroy this, but perfluorooctanic acid, PFOA, is contaminating Hoosick Falls, and I wonder if the panel knows about this, because Flint is really just a smoking gun, I think, and a harbinger for things to come. And the second point is we see an increase in more bottled water in these communities, and I come from the waste management field, and I'm a little bit concerned about that, too, because if you look at some of the bottled water, where is it bottled from? Municipal sources. Yes, it's about 25%. Okay. Uh, that really wasn't a question. I'm going to give you. you got that I, and and I just wanted to add something about the demand side piece. You know, um, it, it's a, a paradox or conundrum because you know, as demand goes down, we get less money into our mm -hmm. um, our water treatment and our, and our water plant. Our water system, our water utility, is an enterprise zone, so it has to exist on the money it gets in from the ratepayers. Um, it doesn't get any general fund money from the city. So, but we're encouraging people to conserve, which is going to um, bring in less money. So we have to start looking at different ways um, to um, assess rates uh, and uh, more creative ways to assess rates. And, and, and I would just also add that as a city, um, as, as the leader of the city of West Palm Beach and as West Palm Beach, we need to model water conservation and show people that it can be done. We use drip irrigation and you know everything along the ways, but we need to be able to show and incentivize. We incentivize zero scaping, all, all of that. I'm sorry, I just had to add to that. You were ter <laughs> terrific, and we are now unfortunately out of time. I hope this extraordinary group has served to tee up the water issue that you're going to think about for the next couple of days as we make the turn into Earth Day. And I want to thank all of thank you, you for your time and your, your work and your passion. And uh, we wish you a fabulous conference. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. And thank you all uh, to the students. You know, go for it. Uh, Mayor, what, what, if students here are interested in coming and working with you, this is a real, this is a real it's offer, a real right? Offer. Yes, right? of course. So um, they could come with your cameras, come with your microphones, <laughs> uh, and they can find you during the break or something and yes, talk I'll to you? Yes, I'll be here all day. Um, and uh, you can also just go on our website, wpb.org, send me an email. Uh, let me know if you're interested. Oh, okay, we'll track you down. And Betty, okay. thank you to Betty. She was one of our StoryFest judges, so she'll be back um, and stays with us. Uh, you know, it's an interesting conversation on water, and throughout the water conversation, I was thinking about this guy, Jerry, here. Jerry's a farmer, right? right? You need water to grow crops to eat food. Jerry, have you noticed a difference in climate and in the rain? I mean, we talk a lot about climate. You've been doing this for a lot of years. Is there actually a difference that you've seen? Yes, there's a, there's a finite difference, and, and it's measurable. Um, that's not on, I don't think, but that's okay. Just scream. I run tractors. I don't run microphones around. But, uh, um, still working on it. That's all right. That's all right. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, there is, there is a definite. More water, less water? There's, there's probably more water, but it's in shorter episodic events. So it comes in downpours. That's correct. Instead of the misting that you used to. So you've really seen a difference? It's very observable. 
So we'll hear more from Jerry later, but there is a difference. These are some of the challenges that, that we face. I want to tell you, if you go to planetforward.org, other stories, we have one called Shower Smart. Talk about innovations. So this is a student, Vanessa Cordova, from the University of Mississippi, does a selfie video in creative ways to conserve water by routing drains from your shower to your yard and plants. Okay. Other ideas? How many of you guys have been to California lately? Anybody? Okay, toilets there, they flush differently now, don't they? You have the big flush and the little flush, and you save water in doing it, and huge amounts of water in how we flush our toilets. Uh, I want to draw your attention to another kind of storytelling outside. You'll notice also from SUNY ESF, there's urban environmentalism, a piece of art out there done by Vivian Steinbaugh. Is Vivian here? No, but her art is, so check that out outside.